Hi, I'm Dr. Grauman, and I'm a family doctor in Winnipeg. Thank you for joining me today to learn a little bit about iron deficiency anemia, which is a really important issue to me. So what we'll talk about today is, what is iron deficiency anemia? What causes it? What might you feel if you have iron deficiency anemia? What kind of complications can iron deficiency anemia cause in your health? How does it get diagnosed? And finally, my favorite part, what can we do about it? So iron deficiency anemia is a situation where you don't have enough blood. And anemia means without blood in Greek. And our red blood cells are built from iron. It's the most important backbone of the red blood cells. So without iron, our body can't make red blood cells. Our red blood cells have a really important function. They carry oxygen to every tissue in the body. So if you can imagine every part of your body holding its breath, every organ and tissue, that's a little bit of what's going on when you have anemia. It is very important for muscle tissue in the heart, muscle tissue in your skeletal muscle, and without it, you don't have as much strength. The muscles are more atrophic. It's also one of the most important components in the energy factories of the cell, mitochondria, for something called the electron transport chain. So the iron is needed to move the electrons around to generate energy that your body then uses. So you can see it's pretty important. Why would someone have low iron then if it's so important? Well, one reason might be if you have trouble absorbing it in your gut. And some people do have some conditions in their gut where they have trouble absorbing it. These could be inflammatory bowel diseases. They could be ulcers, weight loss surgeries where you're missing part of your gut. It can also be medications that decrease the absorption of iron, like a very common medication to reduce the acid levels in your stomach for heartburn. Cancer also uses a lot of iron, but can also prevent the absorption of iron. Another reason that you might not have enough iron is if you're running through it too quickly. And one way you could run through your iron too quickly is if you're bleeding. So some people have conditions that cause blood loss. This can be bleeding in the gut. It can also be bleeding from surgeries. It can be bleeding from accidents. Some people donate blood regularly, and when they go to donate blood again, they might be told, you gotta wait your hemoglobin's not high enough. Other times in your life, you might need more iron than usual. An example of this is when you start to menstruate. So uh, when you start to menstruate, you have a source of blood loss, which means that you need more iron to keep your hemoglobin levels up. And we do see that commonly, that when women start to menstruate, they have lower hemoglobin, less iron. And the same is true in pregnancy, because you no longer need iron just for one person, now you need it for someone else. Another reason that people's iron can be low is if they don't get enough in their diet. There are some very restrictive diets where maybe you're not getting enough iron, and so you can run low that way as well. Some of the symptoms you might have if you have iron deficiency or anemia, you'd feel tired. You wouldn't have the same amount of energy, and that's because your body is lacking that oxygen. It might be lacking that energy production, and your muscles might be weaker. You might feel dizzy your heart rate might be high. You might feel very abnormally weak. Um, these symptoms can come along quickly. You might notice that your skin color is very pale. But when it's something that happens more slowly, it's more likely that the signs will be more subtle. And they'll be related to being tired, feeling tired, not having energy, maybe not being able to do the normal walk that you do, run the normal block that you do without getting short of breath, feeling like you can't get enough air. And you might also feel depressed. Um, some people will suffer low mood after feeling tired for so long and think, oh, I'm depressed, but it could actually be from the symptoms of iron deficiency. We do worry about some consequences, um, some complications from iron deficiency anemia. I mean, the main one is, is feeling tired, but we also worry about some subtle things, particularly brain development in infants, because during pregnancy in the second trimester, when the brain is developing, we think that uh, iron is potentially very important for that development. And there have been some studies that show that some of those developmental delays, neurocognitive delays, actually can't be fixed and can persist for a very long time. So not to be overly alarmist there, but it is something that is concerning and it is something that doctors think could potentially be easily prevented by making sure that the condition is diagnosed and treated at the right point in pregnancy or even before pregnancy. So how do we diagnose iron deficiency anemia? You probably can guess. You can do a blood test and find out what your hemoglobin levels are if you're anemic. And then we also have a really good test 
that can show the iron levels, the iron stores that your liver has, and it's called ferritin. Ferritin is a great test, but it's not perfect because your ferritin levels can also go up uh, if you have inflammation of the liver or if you have inflammation in general in your body. And so there are other tests. There's also stool samples to see if you're losing blood through the gut. And then there's one of doctor's favorite approaches, which is to look directly at the gut with a camera to see if there's any areas of the gut that look like they don't absorb very well, are diseased, or maybe some sources of blood loss, like some ulcers or other places that could be bleeding. How can we prevent iron deficiency? Well, if we talk about a healthy diet, health scientists in Canada have really worked very hard to try and come up with some numbers for how much iron people might need on a daily basis. It's a very hard thing to come up with because everybody is unique. But this is the best guess from the Government of Canada uh, recommendations for elemental iron intake every day. So the main source of iron for us is in our diet. There's two kinds of iron. There's heme iron and non-heme iron. Heme iron is mostly found in animal products and it's really well absorbed. So you find it in red meat. So it's a very important source of iron. You can also find it in seafood. But of course, there's also iron in plants. It's less well absorbed. Some plants don't have that much. But if you're selective about what you eat, you can also get a lot of iron from plants. So there's quite a bit of iron in beans, lentils, some nuts, pulses in general, spinach, and then famously, for some people, um, molasses. Another way you can get your iron is from oral iron supplements, which are kind of like vitamins. They're pills that you would get at the grocery store or the pharmacy. And there's different kinds. So one of the most common, usually uh, one of the first things that doctors turn to when they're recommending a supplement would be an iron salt. Examples of that are ferrous fumarate, ferrous gluconate, ferrous sulfate. And just like the name sounds, it's some iron stuck on a salt. But there's other tricks and techniques and oral iron products that have been designed to try and boost absorption by attaching the iron to something other than a salt, such as a polypeptide, which is a protein molecule, a polysaccharide, which is a sugar complex, or a liposome. In fact, the iron is wrapped up by the liposome, and that's a fat molecule. So those are all things that our gut is designed to absorb as part of our diet, and they're other tricks of the trade of, to try and get people to absorb their oral iron. So if you do have questions about oral iron products, particularly ones that might be advertised online, when you buy oral iron products, it's also really important to consider the source of the information about the oral iron product. You want it to be something that the quality is regulated well, that there's some experience, clinical experience with that product as well. Please do ask your pharmacist or your family doc because they'll be happy to orient you to the ones that are making claims about their iron content that can be backed up or supported uh, versus ones that may not be facing the same level of quality control and regulation. Now, I wish that oral iron worked for everybody, but there are some potential side effects of oral iron, the supplements. One of them is it can upset your stomach, and that's why there's so many different kinds of oral iron. It's an attempt to get better absorption but also reduce these side effects of stomach upset. So for some people, oral iron is gonna work great, and it's typically the first go-to of, of family doctors. But for other people, they're just not gonna be able to stomach it. Iron pills can also cause constipation. And if you remember some of the conditions that we talked about before, some of those are already associated with stomach upset and constipation. And so by trying to fix one problem, you can make the original problem worse for patients. I mean, I wish everybody could take oral iron products, but for those people that can't, we do have one other option. The other option would be to go with an IV infusion of iron. And the idea behind that is you skip the gut completely. You just go into the blood supply and you don't have to worry about that absorption problem. You also avoid the side effects on the gut of constipation and stomach upset, typically, if you go directly into the blood supply. Another nice thing about IV infusions is you can give very large amounts of iron at once, and then it can release slowly over the next couple of weeks. So you can replace iron very quickly. Now, of course, with an IV, that's usually done in a healthcare setting. And with IV products, you also are supposed to be monitored for 30 minutes after any kind of IV product 
to watch out for serious allergic reactions. So this might be an option for someone that can't tolerate oral iron or is not able to absorb it through no fault of their own, just a medical condition that they have. It's also something that if you don't have the time to replace your iron by mouth, orally, like say later on in a pregnancy or with a very important surgery that's coming up soon, that you can use this instead and replace your iron over weeks instead of months. So some of the problems with the IV iron is that there are some risks and side effects. A lot of people don't like getting an IV put in. It's not necessarily as pleasant as swallowing a pill. And in addition to the IV, iron is very dark. It's a dark colored product and it loves the lining of blood vessels. So it can cause some staining of the skin. It can cause some staining of the blood vessels too. And that's despite the best efforts of healthcare professionals to make sure that the IV is in the right place, doesn't leak into the skin, and make sure that the IV line is maintained clear and flushed so that the iron doesn't stick around too long in the vein and have an opportunity to stick to that lining of the blood vessel. When you do get a stain from IV iron, it can last for a really long time. And treatments for that kind of stain may not be very effective. You may just have to wait. These stains also tend to take six to eight months to fade. So that's a side effect of IV infusions that I really try to avoid, but it isn't very common. Another possible reaction or side effect of the IV infusions is something called a fishbane reaction. It's not life-threatening, but it is very unpleasant. What a fishbane reaction is, is it's essentially a pseudo-allergy, and a pseudo-allergy that can involve flushing of the skin, gets hot, warm, red, and then you can have some muscle contractions, like in your back, your chest, your stomach, your legs. Very unpleasant, not life-threatening. The way that this is managed is that the IV is stopped and it will resolve within 15 minutes. But those can be an uncomfortable 15 minutes. Then the IV can be started again and you can complete your infusion. The other frustrating part about a fish bane reaction or pseudoallergy is it's very unpredictable. You can have a perfect infusion one time, and that doesn't change the possibility of getting that type of reaction the next time. Same thing, if your first time you get an IV infusion, you get a fish vein, you're unlucky, that doesn't mean that you're gonna get it next time. But you do worry with IV iron and any IV product about a serious allergic reaction. It's estimated with IV iron that the rate of a serious allergic reaction is less than one in 200,000. So there are different IV iron products. There's some low dose ones, and those are really great if you only need a small amount of iron or if you're getting IVs regularly and you want to break up the iron infusions across, say, multiple dialysis treatments when you have chronic kidney disease. Examples of that are things like iron sucrose or sodium ferric gluconate complex. Now, if you need a lot more iron than that, which is generally the case for people, this can result in multiple infusions just to get the right amount of iron. And given the risks of each infusion, that might not be the best choice for you. So your doctor might recommend a high dose IV iron product. Now the one that we have available in Canada is called ferric deriso-maltose. And you can give very large amounts of iron. IV infusions also take time. So the low dose ones, typically you're looking at at least 20 minutes, but potentially several hours for the infusion. It depends on the healthcare setting that you get it in. So what does the future look like? Well, there are some great treatments for iron deficiency anemia, but it's important to get the word out about them and get the word out about the diagnosis. So you can help. You can help your acquaintances, family members, and loved ones know about the symptoms of iron deficiency, and if necessary, know about the testing and the treatment so that they can get the help sooner. You can also help spread the word within your community so there's more places that we can get these treatments so that they become more available. Other things that we hope for in the future and we can advocate for as patients, as providers, is products that have higher doses of iron for the people that need them and are better absorbed and maybe have fewer side effects. So I'm very optimistic for the future, especially with people like yourself who took the time to learn about this issue that I care about so much and listen all the way through to the end of this video.